chills. Number six, the locked door. Brett Muglen and Mark Hartman were both in their fourth year at Ohio State University when they decided to become roommates for the semester. The house they moved into was dingy and moldy, and the power went out all of the time. But the rent was cheap, plus the place was shared by 10 other students, and most of them were girls so they didn't mind it there too much. One night after the power went out, Brett went downstairs by himself into the basement to flip the circuit breaker back on. While he was down there, he thought he heard some movements nearby. It could have been anything, he thought. After all, the only thing down there was a door to the utility closet and it was always locked shut. Little did he know that things were only going to get weirder. In fact, a bizarre series of events would soon leave Brett and the other tenants thoroughly creeped out. Aside from the unexplainable noises coming from the basement, the drawers in the oven were constantly left open in the kitchen that they all shared together and the lights are always being turned on when no one was around. Since the roommates didn't have any other explanations, they began to think that the house was haunted. After all, it was a large, moldy, creepy house that seemed just right for a ghost to stalk around in. When Brett went down into the basement to turn the power back on like usual, a stranger startled him. The man said that he was an Ohio State student named Jeremy who had been living in the house for a while, but when Brett questioned him further, the man just walked upstairs and left the home. Alarmed now, Brett and Mark decided to check and see what was behind the locked door once and for all. The landlord came to the property along with the police, and together they pried the lock off the door. What they saw next came as quite a shock. There was no utility closet as originally thought, but instead they found a fully furnished room complete with a mattress and a private toilet. The intruder had been using a side entrance to get into the basement without anyone noticing. Personal photos in the room show none other than Jeremy posing what appeared to be friends and family. The landlord changed the locks and the students tried their best to get back to a normal life. Meanwhile, the man known as Jeremy remains at large. Number 5 on Jenny's Block In the year 2000, Jennifer Lopez starred in a movie called The Cell where she literally travels inside the subconscious mind of a crazed psychopath to search for answers. Little did Lopez know that 13 years later she would become embroiled with a similarly insane person, only this time it would be in real life. His name was John Dubis, and he was an ex-firefighter from Rhode Island who was placed on disability pension after a crippling injury left him unable to find employment. The exact nature of the accident has not been disclosed to the public but after taking one look at his social media history, you might begin to suspect it involved a serious head injury. Sometime after becoming disabled, Dubis began to openly obsess about Jennifer Lopez on his Facebook account. Using the screen name David A. Lopez, he began to post what he called Jenny Art. Usually this is where he carved his initials along with hers into a tree, but other times it was random graffiti around the city that he felt specifically pertained to his underlying love and affection towards Jennifer Lopez. Other Facebook posts included invitations for his dear wife Jenny to come live with him, but most of it was semi-incoherent musings, the strangest of which being a photo of Dubis aggressively biting a box of chocolates with the caption that reads, Jenny always sending me love. Whether or not he truly believed he was in a relationship with Jenny is unclear but many people speculate that he was most likely delusional enough to hallucinate a fantasy world where she was sending him gifts. In August, Dubis grew tired of his fantasies and yearned for the real thing, to be with Jennifer Lopez in the flesh. To accomplish this, he drove to Southampton, New York and broke into the pool house of her $10 million private estate. Even though his car was out front, None of Lopez's roving security guards noticed him for six days as he walked around her property and committed some truly confounding acts. At one point, he cleaned up a pathway for her as a nice gesture. He also frequently pleasured himself in her front yard. When later questioned by police, he casually explained he did this because he felt that Lopez wanted him to quote unquote spread my seed throughout the world. He posted on Facebook about his exploits the entire time he stalked Jenny first putting up a receipt from a nearby clothing store to prove that he was in Southampton, and then taking a picture from the pool house to show how close he was to Jennifer Lopez's actual home. Who knows what else he would have done if he was not captured within a week of breaking in. 
Unfortunately, this does not make the end of Jennifer Lopez's encounters with the man. Shortly after being released, he called Lopez's mother and pretended to be her son. This landed him in jail yet again. Number 4. Tracy Checks Again In South Carolina, a 41-year-old woman who identifies herself only as Tracy to news reporters explained that she was the victim of a malicious stalker who had violated her privacy and made her fearful for her own life. Tracy felt someone watching her all of the time in her small home, especially at night. She often heard strange noises coming from upstairs. Panicking at times, she often called her sons to check the attic upstairs. They were never able to find anything. After a while, they joked that she was paranoid or going senile, and they brushed it off as some kind of stray animal from the woods. One night, as Tracy lay in bed struggling to sleep, there was a loud thumping coming from the attic. This was no animal. The thumping grew so intense that the nails started to pop out of her bedroom ceiling one at a time. Instead of calling her sons, this time she called her nephew over to the house and made him check upstairs more thoroughly than anyone had ever before. At first, it seemed as though nothing was in the attic aside from the two of them. Slowly, her nephew walked to the far end of the attic. There was a completely darkened sector where the light bulb had burned out long ago that he wanted to check out. The floorboards creaked below his feet. When he got there, he found Tracy's ex-boyfriend looking back at him, huddled in a makeshift bed that was made from coats. The ex-boyfriend gave a malicious smile. Even though he and Tracy had broken up 12 years ago, he had never forgotten her. In fact, he had just gotten out of jail for stealing Tracy's car. Sometime after being released, he had crawled into the attic to watch and listen to her every move. With no explanation, he silently left the house still smiling. Police could not determine exactly how many days he stayed in the attic, but based on the numerous cups from the nearby Sonic fast food restaurant that were found to be filled to the brim with urine and excrement, he must have been there for some time. Police have not been able to find him ever since he made his grinning exit. Number 3. Watch from the floor vents in 2012, a woman in Massachusetts needed some simple repairs done to a trailer home. The trailer's former owner, a 47-year-old man named Christian Hobbs, was a handyman who was glad to help, but not before making a few private adjustments of his own. Little did the woman know, these adjustments would not be for her son or her toddler's son's benefits, but rather for his own sick and sinister self-gratification. Soon after the repairs were complete, the woman whose name has been withheld by news outlets for privacy's sake heard a loud noise in her bathroom floor vent. To her, it sounded like it could have been an animal. Concerned, she got down on the floor and peered inside the vent. A human face stared directly back at her. Hey, it's just me. Don't be scared, a familiar voice said. It was Christian Hobbs, the handyman. Hobbs had been very busy. First, he planted baby monitors throughout the home so he could hear whatever the family did at any moment of the day. Next, he cut a hole under the trailer, climbed inside, cut a second hole of the trailer, this time through the bathroom floor vent, and climbed inside of there. He stayed in this hiding spot under the trailer for two days straight with an assortment of energy bars, beverages, and tissues. And he busied himself by watching and recording the woman and her toddler son both using the bathroom with his cell phone. In total, police recovered 16 minutes worth of voyeuristic footage. A Salem, Massachusetts judge sentenced Hobbs to serve between 3-6 to six years in a state prison, saying that she would have given him more time if it were legally possible. Unfortunately, she said the biggest law that Hobbs broke, violating privacy, was only a misdemeanor. Number 2. The Slenderman It was 1941 and Theodore Edward Coney's like many other Americans who were just coming out of the Great Depression, was facing a harsh life of extreme poverty. This penniless desperation was what prompted him to visit an old friend in Denver, Colorado, named Philip Peters to ask for help. Peters was much older than Coney's, and had managed to squirrel away a fair bit of wealth in his advanced years. Coney's had intended to ask him for money, but upon arrival, he found the door to be unlocked. Nobody was there, so he stepped inside and made himself at home. For months, Philip Peters was visiting his elderly wife in the hospital. Just to give you some indication of how old they were, she had just broken her hip. When Philip Peters returned, Coney's made a decision in his mind. 
Rather than asking for money and possibly being turned away, he would instead live in the old man's house without him knowing. Konyes had an extremely gaunt figure with gangly arms and long spindly fingers. He used his small stature to his advantage by holding himself away in the attic by squeezing through a door that no normal sized person could fit through. Kony soon made a routine of waiting until Peters left the house before dropping down to eat food and take care of his hygienic needs before the old man got back. Peters was 73 years old at the time, so he did not really notice what was going on. It wasn't the best plan in the world, but it had been working so far, until one day. Kony's left his attic about to cook himself some food as normal. He thought Peters had left for the day, but the old man was actually taking a nap and Peters was quite surprised to find his longtime friend helping himself in the kitchen. The conversation that followed is not exactly clear. Perhaps Coney's came clean and apologized at first, or even started asking for some money. Either way, Coney's eventually decided to savagely murder his friend by beating him to death with a pistol. One could only imagine what was going through Peters' mind as his friend struck him over and over again in his own kitchen. Did he beg for his life? Did he ask his friend why he was doing this in between the blows? Afterwards, police were baffled by the murder. It made no sense. All of the doors and windows were locked, so how did the killer leave the house? As the police continued to investigate the crime scene, Coney's laid cramped in his attic quarters directly above them. The police reasoned that no one could fit through the tiny attic door, so they inadvertently left him alone. When Peter's widowed wife moved back into the home, she and her son kept hearing strange noises. Lights that they were sure they had turned off were mysteriously turned back on. In their mind, the house was clearly haunted. In fact, they could not hang on to a housekeeper because the help would always become afraid and quit. Eventually, Peter's grief-stricken ex-wife moved away and Coney's once again had the property to his own. Much like the widow, neighbors soon grew suspicious after they began to hear noises emanating from the home late at night and began to see lights seemingly turn on all by themselves. To them, the house was clearly haunted by Philip Peter's ghost, or maybe the ghost who had killed him. Police still had a sneaking suspicion about the case and never gave up. One night, about nine months after the gruesome murder, they finally got their break. On a routine surveillance, they saw someone peeking from behind the curtains at the old Peter's residence. The police barged into the abandoned home and saw Cooney's small frame scurrying into his attic hideaway. It was too late for him to get away. He was caught and nicknamed the Spider-Man of Denver for his spidery fingers and the way in which he eluded the police in his lair. In 1967, the prison inmate died just as he had lived, alone and in cramped quarters. Number 1. Extra Physical Therapy Carlo Castellanos Faria had a normal job working as a parking attendant at a hospital in Washington, D.C. One day, he met a beautiful girl named Michelle Fredenberg Onion, who he himself would later describe as instantly becoming quote unquote madly in love with. While many long term relationships have been known to start out in a similar love at first sight fashion, Carlo's version of madly in love becomes far more disturbing when you consider that is what he gave as an explanation to a judge while on trial for burglary and stalking charges. In any event, Carlo could not keep his eyes off Michelle from that day on. He needed to have her and he needed to let her know. Unfortunately, Michelle did not reciprocate his advances. Instead of running into his arms like he thought she would, she ran to his superiors and told them not to let Carlo near her anymore. She was the director of physical therapy, so he was fired right away. But Carlo knew she was playing hard to get. He knew that she secretly wanted him, whether she knew it or not, and that they were destined to be together. That's why he had a plan. Before he had gotten fired, Carlo would be left alone with Michelle's keys every day when he parked her car. This is how he had gotten her house key copied, out of love of course and it's also how he had lovingly let himself into her apartment for a fun date night at home. He must have wanted their first date to be extra special, so he let himself into her home two days early to give himself plenty of time to prepare for the big night. Since he wanted to remember their big moment together forever, he set up a camera in her room that pointed directly at her bed. This way, he could film their big date and watch it over and over again. 
Then he climbed underneath the bed and waited. The day did not go exactly as Carlo had planned. Michelle had a boyfriend with her, and early in the morning, he noticed something moving around on the floor. He looked under the bed and found Carlo. Then he beat him severely with a flashlight until the police arrived. Things would have not gone well for Michelle if her boyfriend was not there to rescue her. Under her bed with him, Carlo had a box of condoms and a power cord. 